And, and starting outside the front row, the NASCAR Grand National Champion from Franklin, Tennessee, the Pepsi Challenger, Darrell Waltrip. Darrell, you are one of five drivers here today with what we would consider a very new chassis built by a Dennis Spring. Obviously, it worked well to your liking yesterday. Well, I'm impressed with the car because it's built a lot like a Grand National car. It has a, what we refer to as a, as a, a Ford front end on it. It has rack and pinion steering, coilovers, and it really is uh, something that I'm familiar with. To assess your driving style, aggressive, can we anticipate a drive right to the front for Darrell Waltrip? Well, I'm in the front, so I hope I can just stay here. Uh, I'm going to run hard. Uh, it pays a little bit of lap money, and the car's running well, and if I don't get blown away here by some of these guys that are used to run here all the time, uh, I'm going to run hard and try to lead this thing. Obviously, the track conditions will determine uh, what the weather is like. It is hot, it is very humid, and that will play both on the car, the slickness of the track, and for the driver fatigue. Well, these cars are very hot. The headers run over the engine, over the top, and out the right side of the car. You get a lot of heat in the cockpit. But, you know, it's a short race, only 200 miles, so uh, that's not bad when you're used to running 500. All right, outside row number two, number 11, Darrell Waltrip. Thank you, Darrell. And starting outside row two back over here is the defending champion of this race, Dick Trickle. He is driving the familiar number 99, but the color scheme has changed this year. The color scheme now is red and yellow. And if we can get Dick over here, Dick, if you will, what happened to the White Knight? Well, we had to return the cars to Junior Hanley this week, and I come up with this car here just in a hurry. And Rusty had a backup car. And, uh, it's very competitive. I'm very happy that I just got it. And going into next week, we'll be building our own new car and have it out by the next ASA show. And Rusty Wallace's backup car, you out-qualified Rusty, so can we anticipate Dick Trickle getting faster as the race progresses? Well, the car feels real good, and I figure we're competitive, but if it's my day, I'll win, and if it isn't, we'll just do the best we can. Okay, Bob, two of the top names starting up in front. We'll have pre-race activities from State Fair Park in Milwaukee in just a moment. first 24 qualifiers. Now the first 24, top 24, were automatically locked into the starting lineup, and then the others made the way into the field by competing in two qualifying races. As you can see, the cars are lined up toward the inside of the racetrack, and we're just moments away from the start. One of the finest fields ever assembled, and there's also an interesting story Ladies that's just gentlemen. below the main paragraph For of this race. All the it's a story a about a car builder who considers this weekend his milestone day. He has most Miller of the headline time. drivers driving his Gentlemen, cars today. let's go racing! It is the story of Dennis Springs of nearby Germantown, Wisconsin, a suburb of Milwaukee. Listen to his list of drivers for this weekend. Joe Ruttman, Darrell Waltrip, Mark Martin, David Pearson, and Alan Kowicki. He's been building race cars for about 15 years, and finally, he says, the fraternity has recognized his machines for their true value. The command to start engines, of course, has been given, and the 40 cars that will be competing in today's race get ready to go. As the cars are started, the crew members raise their hands, indicating that that particular car has started, and now the signal to move out they pull out of the pit area onto the racetrack and we get set to go 200 miles of what should be tremendous, exciting competition. Johnny Potts, the official starter for the American Speed Association, given the signal to the individual drivers with his checkered flag to proceed on to the race course. This will be a 200 lap race on a one mile course, 200 miles. Now pit stops are not nearly as critical in this type of racing as they are Grand National racing. They are important, don't get me wrong. These cars are capable of going the distance in terms of fuel on just one pit stop. But there will be caution flags and look for most of the top competitors to duck into the pits on almost every caution flag, to check their tires, to make chassis adjustments, and to top the fuel off every time. Now let's take a look at the starting lineup for today's race. In the front row from Nacita, Wisconsin, qualifying at 116.898, Jim Sauter, outside of row number one from Franklin, Tennessee, Darrell Waltrip. In the second row, car number 97, driven by Alan Kulwicki of Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Outside of row number two from Wisconsin Rapids, Wisconsin, Dick Trickle in car 99. 
in row number three, car number 66, driven by Rusty Wallace from Valley Park, Missouri, and number 52, Butch Miller from Lawton, Michigan. In the fourth row, car number 88, Mike Eddy from Midland, Michigan, and car number 22, Bobby Allison from Hueytown, Alabama. In the fifth row, Joe Rutman in car 19, and number 60, David Pearson. In the sixth row, car number 12, Gary Ballou, and 84, Bob Sineker. In the seventh row, Harold Fair in car number 81, and Mark Martin in number two. In the eighth row, car number zero, Tom Jones, and 79, Bobby Dodder. In the ninth row, car number 18, Mike Miller, and number 24, Jody Ridley. In the tenth row, 14, Al Schill, and 80, driven by Bob Strait. In the 11th row, car number 38, Steve Seelman, and number 23, Davey Allison. In row number 12, Dennis Vogel in car number 51, and Arnie Kristen in number 17. In the 13th row, car number 7, Don Gregory, and number 40, Terry Seneker. In the 14th row, car number 92, driven by Willie Gayton, and number 21, David Green, Jr. In the 15th row, Rick Corelli in car number 6, and Kurt Cheshire in number 56. In the 16th row, Dennis Martin in car number 20, and Tom Harrington in number 4. The 17th row, Dennis Landman in car number 9, and Mutley Kurkowski in car 27. The 18th row, Ed Evans in car number 93, and Buddy Schrock in 35. 19th row, Brad Campbell in 49, and Mike Patrick in 8. And in the 20th row, car 26, Dave Tomzak, and number 90, Ken Stauffer. Another one of those significant sidebar stories here is the team of Nicky Prejean. He's a Cajun from down south in Louisiana. As we look at the starting field, file by for the last time under a parade speed conditions. There they are going by. You see Al Schill, one of the local drivers, passing by there. One of the three cars that was entered by Nicky Prejean, that Cajun we are talking about, who incidentally fights oil rig fires for a living, is Rusty Wallace. One of the three race favorites. He has won eight of the 14 races he has entered this year. His teammates for today, Dick Trickle, who just was able to pick up the ride in midweek of this week, and David Pearson. All three of the cars are painted exactly alike. There is Rusty Wallace in the red, yellow, number 66. And coming up there is David Pearson in the red and yellow, number 60, 60. Remember the third car in this triumvirate, this team that's been entered this weekend, will be number 99, Dick Trickle. David Pearson, who has not run ASA races all that often, has worked very hard here this week. He qualified yesterday with a 200-pound weight penalty. There were some imperfections in the design of the car in terms of the aerodynamics. They have worked on those imperfections over the night. He expects to be faster during the race today. an interesting story. If you've been following racing in the racing newspapers the past 12 months, you've heard of the plight of Gary Ballou. Gary Ballou was involved in a legal battle with the authorities for a while. It appeared as though Ballou was not going to be able to drive race cars, certainly in the 1983 and maybe even on to the rest of his career. But that has been put on the back burner. His trial will be coming to court sometime in the next 12 to 24 months. And in the interim, Gary Ballou has been given permission by the authorities to drive in automobile racing. Now, he has dropped out of the NASCAR right, racing ranks, at least on a temporary basis. But he's been barnstorming around the country, running all pro races as there is Johnny Potts. And he's signaling the drivers to go right and left and signaling them into their two abreast start for today's race. And our camera is right down there with Johnny on the racetrack. The next time they come around, they could get the green flag. Ballou has been running all pro races in the South. He's running some hard go races here in the Midwest. And of course, shows up at most of the major ASA races. He's been working very hard on this chassis. It's a Bob chassis, another one of those chassis that's relatively new to late model stock car racing. And in Technology born out of space exploration has improved our... Racing out of his dad's stable, actually, this weekend with the sponsorship that also adorns the super speedway cars. We've had a car come to a stop in the middle of turn number two. Looks like it's Bob Strait in car number 80, who, for some unexplained reason, has come to a dead stop in the middle of turn number two. So this could certainly play a part in whether or not we get a start this time around. 
There is Strait, the man who started on the outside pole of this race a year ago, one of the consistent top 10 runners in ASA. He had no wins in 1982, but he did have a pole. And he's a guy that is a little disappointed, really, in his results so far in 1983, but has always shown the potential. Now Bob getting underway in his own power. Bob was an enormously slow pace lap. I was convinced that the cars were entering their pace lap, but the speed never really picked up, and maybe that's the problem of what fell straight. Here's a little now, might have been temporary. Well, he's catching up with the rest of the field and will apparently drop into his 20th assigned starting position, but we will go one more lap before getting green. Here comes the field off of turn number four down the main straightaway once again. The car to the inside, the blue car on the pole is driven by Jim Sauter. Alongside him, the famous Pepsi Challenger, number 11, driven by Darrell Waltrip. In the second row will be Alan Kowicki, car number 97, a veteran of ASA competition. And alongside him in row number two, Dick Trickle, the defending champion of this event in car number 99. Then in row number three, Rusty Wallace in 66, and Butch Miller in 52, and Bob Strait's problems looks like are continuing for him as he is stalled over there in turn number between turns three and four to the inside of the racetrack. Some of the safety officials from the Wisconsin Auto Racing Incorporated are giving him a push and uh, hopefully we'll get him back underway, but certainly problems plaguing Bob Strait before the green flag drops. Well, if you miss the starting lineup, I tell you, this is an all-star field to say the least. There are at least 12 or 14 drivers who have the potential to win this. Jim Sauter, who starts in the pole, is right now leading the points in Artco, a basically Wisconsin-founded organization, although Sauter won a couple of races about a week ago and was penalized, actually disqualified, because he had an oversized engine. But Sauter, whom we saw run in the top three of the Daytona 500 a couple of years ago, he comes into this race with a lot of confidence. Needless to say, Walter feels good about being here. There's, there's Davey Allison. We had begun to develop that story a couple minutes ago, just before a uh, straight stall on the racetrack. This is Davey's first pure ASA race. He's run a couple of combined ASA All-Pro shows in the South, and it's an important race for him. Possibly his best chance to do well. He's appearing before the hometown of his dad's sponsor. He's got his dad's sponsor on the car. The car appears to be competitive, and also there are some NASCAR team members who are involved in crewing this car this weekend. So for Davey Allison, a very important race. There is Bob Strait being pushed into the pit area. Bob is a 34-year-old driver from Flossmore, Illinois, and he does not stop in his pit. He continues, well, yes, he does. He stops at his pit at the far end of the racetrack. Meanwhile, the first alternate of the race, number 22, driven by Ken Lund, gets ready to go as he is awaiting the signal from the ASA officials as to whether or not he will be able to start in this race, the hood being taken off of the uh, Bob Strait machine. This race is the gathering of the clans. The warring nations from across this great land have come together here at the Milwaukee State Fair Park. And there's a guy who is the lone representative of his hometown of Denver, Colorado. The name is Rick Corelli. If you have not heard it before, but you're a racing fan, record it. Rick Corelli. Here's a guy who won one of the most prestigious late model pavement races this year, the Copper Classic out at Phoenix. He just knocked him dead out there. He's been running very strong back home in Colorado and Idaho. He's been taking more or less the Joe Rutman route toward Major League Professional Automobile Racing, running up and down the West Coast, running around the States. Corelli is a tough racer, although he found the going pretty uphill here this weekend. He starts in 29th position and had to work his way into the starting lineup in one of the qualifying races yesterday afternoon. Bob Strait is out of the pit area trying to catch up with the field as he goes down the back stretch. Meanwhile, the field coming out of turn number four. The pace car is into the pit area. Here they come, looking for green, and they get it. The Milwaukee 200 is underway down the back stretch. It is the pole sitter. Jim Sutter driving in second position as Darrell Waltrip and Alan Kowicki running third as they head for turn number three on the first circuit of 200. Jim Sutter still continuing to lead. Waltrip and Kowicki running second and third. Off of turn number four, about to complete lap number one. That's the way the first three will be recorded. Running in fourth position is Rusty Wallace and then Dick Trickle. It's a tough call. Do you charge and show everything you have early on? 
Probably not. But you can't really pace yourself as much as you can really in a NASCAR race. Although in 1983, pacing in a NASCAR race has become a little passe also. But this is not a long race. It's not a short race. 200 miles goes by reasonably quick on this racetrack. Firebird. Now, the breakdown of the field here today, there are 17 Firebirds and 23 Camaros in competition. The first alternate was a Thunderbird. However, he was unable to uh, go because Bob Strait did pull out onto the track at the last minute and join the competition. They continue to run in pretty much the same the first three, Jim Sauter, followed closely by Darrell Waltrip, Alan Kulicki is third, fourth is Rusty Wallace, driving fifth is Dick Trickle, and going in sixth position is Mike Eddy in car number 88. They come off of turn number four, about to complete lap number four, and a good close battle up front between Jim Sauter and yellow there is 10 and 11. Jason Pearson runs in 10th position for one of those Nicky Prejean race cars. And Gary Ballou running in 11th position and right behind them in 12th position, the winningest driver of all time in ASA competition, Bob Seneker. The first two drivers, Ballou, and there goes Ballou to the inside of Pearson. One of those drivers come down the main straightaway, Gary Palou picks up the position in car number 12 and now moves into 10th. David Pearson falls back into 11th position and running 12th is Bob Seneker in car 84. Now Seneker moves to the inside of Pearson down the back stretch. He'll try to make the move going into turn number 3, but the higher groove appears to be the one that, that David Pearson is in. Now Seneker moves up once again to challenge toward the inside. Seneker and David Pearson battling for 11th position off of the turn and down the main straightaway. It is Seneker picking up the position. Seneker moves into 11th. Pearson drops back to 12. The leader, meanwhile, continues to be Jim Sauter. In car number five, Darrell Waltrip running second, and Alan, make that Alan Kowicki now running in second position, and Darrell Waltrip is third. So Alan Kowicki moves around Darrell Waltrip on that last lap to go into second position. And Waltrip now has his rear view mirrors full of number 66, Rusty Wallace, as again they come down the main straightaway. Alan runs in second position at this point of the race is one of the most all-around racing drivers we have run across in quite some time. He is obviously expert behind the wheel. He is just excellent with sponsors, and he's also a great technician. The field is lapping around the oval at about 113 miles per hour. That's about three miles per hour slower than they qualified, but at this stage of the race, kind of what you expect. Look at all those yellow cars involved once again up front. It's Kowicki, Waltrip, and I believe Rusty Wallace, followed by Mike Eddy. Little bit of distance there between second place Alan Kowicki and this man, Darrell Waltrip. There is the fourth place car of Rusty Wallace, car number 66. Rusty hailing from Valley Park, Missouri. This is the battle for third and fourth position here in turn number four. Darrell Waltrip going high and Rusty Wallace looking to the inside. They come out of the fourth turn and go into single file order down the main straightaway. It would appear at this time, this early stage of the race, that perhaps it's just a cat and mouse wait and see game as the heat may play a factor here in the event. The temperature nearing 90 degrees right now and the humidity quite high also. So not only are they taking it easy on the cars, but the drivers perhaps taking it easy here in the early going. Darrell Waltrip and Rusty Wallace, third and fourth position in turn four. I don't think Waltrip is getting quite the fight that he would prefer to get, although as Bob suggested, he might be doing a little bit of a sight job on those behind him, you never really know, but Darrell doesn't seem to be able to stay down in the bottom and run as fast as the two competitors directly in front of him or the two directly behind him. Wallace keeps taking a look down on the low side, particularly coming out of turn number four. Meanwhile, while this is going on for third and fourth, 
Actually, the two leaders, headed up by Jim Sauter, are putting just a little bit of distance between themselves and the rest of the field. All right, let's run down the top ten for you with ten laps completed. It is Jim Sauter, the leader, followed by Alan Kowicki. Third place, Daryl Waltrip. Fourth is Rusty Wallace, the battle you're watching right now. Fifth place belongs to Dick Trickle. In sixth place, Mike Eddy. Seventh is number 52, driven by Butch Miller. In eighth position, Bobby Allison. Ninth is Joe Rutman, and going tenth on the field is Gary Ballou in car number 12. Now 11 laps have been completed in the Milwaukee 200. Some of the slower cars dropping to the inside of the racetrack and being lapped by the leaders. Now Alan Kowicki goes low in turn number one and tries to move to the inside of Jim Sauter but cannot pick up the position. As a matter of fact, he lost a little bit as he had to hit the brakes in turn number two. So Sauter lengthens his lead just a little bit going into turn number three. As we watch this blue car leading the race, there is another blue car that is really beginning to turn the jam on. If this were roller derby, it's Bob Seneca. Right there, the first blue car, second blue car, Megan Senator, who started this race in 12th position in the last two laps, looked like he was shot out of a cannon. All of a sudden, Senator just started to rocket toward the front. He passed two cars in the last lap, and he's really moving up quickly. So Jim Sauter, who took the lead at the drop of the green flag, is still leading, and we are about to complete lap number 14. Alan Kowicki is running in second place. We'll be back with more of the Milwaukee 200 from State Fair Park in just a moment. Back at Milwaukee where Jim Sauter continues to lead. We get down to Gary Lee in the pit area who is with Bobby Allison's chief mechanic, Gary Nelson. Gary, a chassis, a handling problem in Bobby Allison's car. Well, I don't know if it's really a problem. The car is on the tight side right now. It's got a little bit of a push. Usually he works itself out as the track gets slicker and it gets hotter, so we're not too concerned right now. I, in fact, we may not even make adjustments for it. Uh, we'll wait and see what happens uh, next 20 or 30 laps, and then we'll decide. Other than the push, Bobby is happy with the handling. Yeah, Bobby said the car is running good. It's a long way to the end, so he's going to just settle in at a comfortable pace, keep the leaders in sight, hopefully, and... Uh, you know, uh, when the time comes to make a pit stop, we'll decide whether we need to take a little bit of that push out or, or uh, maybe the track will come to us. A slight push in car 22. Right now, Bobby Allison is running in ninth position but has his hands full with Bob Seneker. Seneker moving to the inside in turn number four and momentarily moves around Bobby Allison to pick up the ninth position. We'll see how they file into turn number one. It looks like that indeed Bob Seneker has moved into ninth and Bobby Allison falls back to tenth. We've also had a scramble for positions up front as Darrell Waltrip is falling back. Sauter continues to lead. Kowicki is second. Rusty Wallace is now running third. In fourth position is Dick Trickle, fifth is Mike Eddy, and now in sixth position is Darrell Waltrip. Seventh, Butch Miller, eighth position belongs to Gary Ballou. So, Darrell Waltrip in car number 11 falling back just a little bit here in the early stages of this race. You can see him there in the screen at the top of the screen as the drivers go around car number 27 driven by Muttley Kurkowski of Perry, Ohio, one of the back markers in this race. There is Waltrip, car number 11, who continues to fall back. He's now back in the seventh position. And Seneca continues to ascend to the top. There's Bob Seneca again, three times. He has won ASA races here in Milwaukee. His winning percentage on this racetrack is just about 50%. He's going to work right now on Darrell Waltrip. Seneca drops slow, running in turn number one. Now that's late turn number two. Watch for the black and yellow marks on the wall. There it is, turn number two, out of turn number two. Down the back stretch, and Seneca has moved into about eighth position. Bob Seneca really on the move. He does not want the leaders to get too far ahead of him as they blast around a couple of slower cars who are slowing significantly, coming out of turn number four, but they get by safe on the high side. Bob Seneca from Door, Michigan, continues to move. So does Jim Sauter in car number five, and Alan Kowicki in number 97. These are your first two positions. 
as Brad Campbell in car number 49 brings his car in for at least the second time. Brad is from South Beloit, Wisconsin, started this race in 37th position, and it looks like that Campbell is having problems. Sauter and Kowicki come out of turn number four. Kowicki staying right up on the back bumper of that 83 Firebird. Alan Kowicki also in a Firebird here this afternoon. Those cars run nose to tail off of turn number two and down the back stretch. We've completed 21 laps of 200. Well, how much does Kowicki have? How much does Sauter have? Be rest assured that one of those two guys is probably not showing us everything that he has at his controls today. At least one of them is playing just a little bit of a waiting game. Question becomes, are both of them playing a waiting game? about the possible problems of Darrell Waltrip as he is dropping back. Let's go to Gary Lee for some further information. Well, Bob, those possible problems are still a question mark. As we heard Darrell say prior to the start of this race, he wanted to get out in front and stay out in front. Right now he's dropping back, but he is saying nothing about any problems with the cockpit. He is in radio contact with the crew, but right now the crew is not really sure if there is a handling problem, if it's tires, if it's chassis. And at this point, they're just simply waiting for Darrell to say something on the radio. Watched enough races that Daryl Waltrip has competed in to know that Daryl Waltrip is a very smart race driver, going. and perhaps he's just taking it easy at this stage in the race, keeping the leaders in sight but not letting them uh, get too far ahead. There is Bobby Allison in car number 22. Bob, absolutely. Waltrip may be in complete control. You never know, and even if they've got a problem in the race car, it's not so important that you're running at maximum speed now. It's so important that you can run at a very long, so nobody among the top 15 or so, we still about 20 cars in the lead lap, nobody is in any sort of trouble whatsoever. They continue to run in the same order. Did Allison pit? Jim Sauter in car number five and Alan Kowicki in car number 97. Did Allison Both pit? of them having a little bit of a problem getting around the number four car driven by Tom Harrington. Now he moves to the inside, coming off of the fourth turn, and both of them are able to pass him. They go down into turn number one. Bobby Allison is running very slowly down the back stretch. We noted last time around that he was running slowly. Well, that car is almost at a standstill now at the end of the back stretch. So trouble for Bobby Allison on lap 25. Bobby Allison, the current points leader, of course, in Grand National Stock Car Racing, he crashed He won this race back in 1978, driving a Matador. And they came here this weekend loaded for bear, bringing, among others, Grand National Crew Chief Gary Nelson, from whom we heard a few minutes ago, Robert Yates, the engine builder, and they had high hopes for this weekend, but I think they're squelched at this point. And the yellow flag is being displayed because of the stalled car of Bobby Allison. He pulled off of the racetrack down into the grass in turn number three, but still that car will have to be removed from that location. So the first yellow of the afternoon comes out. It will be shown to Jim Sauter in car number five. Alan Kulwicki is running in second position. Rusty Wallace third. Dick Trickle is fourth. And Mike Eddy is fifth. Sixth is Butch Miller. Seventh, Gary Ballou. Eighth position is number 11, Daryl Waltrip. In ninth is car 84, Bob Seneker. And tenth, until he dropped out of the race, Bobby Allison. Walkie, Bobby Allison is into the pit area, and so is Davey Allison, his son. Let's find out what's wrong with Bobby. Here's Gary. Well, first of all, with Bobby, he was in radio contact with Gary Nelson, the crew chief. He said, I am losing fuel pressure. The car then died, so right now they're working around the carburetor to detect the problem in car 22. For Davey, we thought it was a routine pit stop under the yellow. He came in, the 11-gallon dump tank was emptied into this 22-gallon fuel cell, but right now there's a conversation that continues between the crew and the driver, so perhaps it's more serious than just the mandatory pit stop. All right. start out in front but here's the battle for second and rusty wallace is to the inside in that car number 66 
the Southland Camaro, and he passes Alan Kowicki, and so Rusty Wallace moves up to second place, and now Kowicki also being passed by Dick Rickle, Mike Eddy, and by Butch Miller. So perhaps Alan Kowicki, who was running so strong there in the early going, ran second for such a long time, is now back to sixth position. I think you got an idea right there how competitive this field is. From second position all of a sudden to sixth, and there's no draft involved here. It's simply a matter of so many tough competitors being right there at the door. The door was cracked and it was like opening up the floodgates. Here they come. Sauter, Wallace, Trickle, Eddie, Miller, Kowicki, Van Ballou. There you see Dick Trickle on the inside of Rusty Wallace a couple of weeks ago at Cayuga. Trickle was in a similar situation with the proprietor of his car. They touched wheels. The proprietor, who happens to be Junior Handley, was spun out. Dick Trickle went on to finish the race, and that's how Trickle lost his ride. Here he is in the same situation again. Good racing in turn number four. Dick Trickle goes to the inside and passes Rusty Wallace. For the moment, at least, Dick Trickle is now in second place. Wallace is in third. And running in fourth place is Mike Eddy in car number 66. Meanwhile, the interval between Jim Sutter, the leader, and second place Dick Trickle now opens up somewhat. We'll try to get an interval for you next time around. But Sutter is running all by himself while the others battle for position. Off of turn number four, onto the main straightaway. Here is Jim Sauter now crossing the start-finish line. And the interval is exactly 1.40 seconds. Now let's go down to Gary Lee in the pit area. Well, right now, Bobby Allison is waiting impatiently for the crew to work on the ignition as he calls a crew member over. As we indicated earlier, there was a push in this car. Then he said apparently a fuel problem. Bob, was there any indication of the problem earlier? Yeah, it started missing and then, uh, then it quit. So obviously they're looking at the ignition right now. It's going to be a very lengthy stop for Bobby Allison. At this point in the Grand National NASCAR season, Bobby Allison is the points leader. And many had thought he would come here this weekend and pretty much dominate the activity. He qualified in eighth position, but early problems have caused Bobby Allison's car to go to the pit area for some extensive work. Meanwhile, his son, Davey Allison, who was also in a few minutes ago, has pulled back out onto the track in competition. There is Dick Trickle, car number 99. Dick hailing from Wisconsin Rapids, Wisconsin. He is 41 years of age, running in second position. And third place still belongs to Rusty Wallace. He's pursued closely by Mike Eddy, and Eddy has competition from the Butch Miller, car number 52. Dick Trickle, who runs in second position, has won more ASA races this year than anybody. Mike Eddy who's on the very left-hand side of your screen, followed by Butch Miller and Alan Kowicki in order. Mike Getty is probably, I guess you might say, the fastest driver week in and week out in ASA racing. He really likes the high banks, and a week ago at Bristol, Mike Getty just knocked him dead. With about 50 laps to go, Mike Getty in that brown and yellow number 18, just went out of your screen, had a three-lap advantage over his closest competitor, the guy who was trailing him then is trailing him now, Butch Miller. And he lost ignition in the race car, or something else underneath the hood at least. The car slowed significantly near the end of the race, and it took a very late yellow flag to give Butch Miller enough of an opportunity to catch, eventually pass Mike Eddy, and Butch Miller went on to his second win of the ASA season. But that guy in the brown and yellow race car is not only one of the fastest, but one of the toughest and one of the most brave race drivers you'll find anywhere. More information, here's Bobby Allison. Well, Bobby Allison, the team has a never-say-die attitude. You waited impatiently in the car, but apparently it's all over. Yeah, the, the ignition quit on the car, and uh, we just don't have uh, the stuff that we need to put a new ignition on. Uh, you know, a lot of times we can come with a backup ignition, but uh, this time we didn't, and uh, this one quit. Most fathers would turn around and walk away, but you have a son out there racing, so is it nail-biting time now for Dad to watch his son? No, I'm going to watch him, but I'm not going to bite my nails. All right, right now, Bobby Allison, a spectator. So Bobby Allison drops out of the race as we pick up the action on the track. Butch Miller in car 52 and Alan Kowicki car 97. Yes, you will notice a car missing. A few 
few laps ago, Mike Eddy in car 88 was in the thick of this battle. Mike Eddy has pulled into the pit area. In fact, has gone behind the wall. It looks like his day is also over. So a couple of top name drivers and a couple of favorites here in this event. Mike Eddy and Bobby Allison have dropped out of the race. Mike Eddy, who has not won in 1983, will not win again. Last year, he led more laps than any other driver. A matter of fact, he led about three times as many laps as his closest pursuer in terms of the laps led over a season category. But Eddy is having his troubles in 1983, and that story is closed for the day. And the word is from his pit area that a broken rod is the reason why Mike Eddy has dropped out of the race. Mike was in seventh position in the ASA point standings going into this event with 734. There is Alan Kulwicki being pursued by Bob Sinecker down the back stretch here. 40 laps have been completed. 40 out of 200. And the leader continues to be Jim Sauter. Running in second position is the number 66 of Dick Trickle. Running in third place is the number 99 of Dick Trickle. Third place belongs to Fourth place is Butch Miller, and fifth is Alan Kowicki. These cars have about 120 to 130 mile range on fuel. They get anywhere from five and a half to six miles a gallon. So, as we pointed out to you at the top of the show, under normal conditions in an ASA race, you don't have to worry too much about fuel. There's ample opportunity to stop. Of course, 120 miles here at this track is 120 laps into the race. We're only up to about 40. continues to lead this event. He has led all the way to this point. Dick Trickle, car number 99, runs in second position, and we are almost a fourth of the way finished for 42 laps into this event. There are the first four at State Fair Park in Milwaukee. I'm Jenkins, Larry Newber, and Gary Lee back at State Fair Park in Milwaukee for the Milwaukee 200 race for ASA Stock Cars. There are your first two positions. And early out, Mike Eddy, here is Gary Lee. It was indeed a short day for Mike Eddy, who was getting very competitive for any indication as to what happened. Uh, something broke in the motor. I think I broke a rod. It just happened all of a sudden. It was running decent, and then all of a sudden it just broke. And obviously, you were so competitive, you were moving up, and there was no warning to the problem. No, there was no warning at all, and I, the motor would have held together. We probably would have had a pretty good shot, but there's always a, that's always a big F, so you never know. We've talked about the heat, how taxing it can be on the car and the driver. Just how difficult was it to drive in this heat out there? Oh, it's, it's plenty warm out there. Uh, it's not as bad as what you'd think it'd be, but it's plenty warm. Uh, a yellow flag is actually worse than racing because you don't get nowhere at all in the car. So another spectator, Mike Eddy, car 88 out of the race. And a couple of laps ago, it looked like that Dick Trickle was going to challenge Jim Sauter for the lead as they came down the straightaway, but that was not the case. And here is the number 60 car of David Pearson, also out of the race, it looks like, as they push that car behind the wall. So another NASCAR competitor drops out of the competition here today. Meanwhile, on the track, it is still Dick Trickle and Jim Sauter a battle for the lead as they lap some of the, some of the slower cars in turn number two and down the back stretch. Here they are moving down the back stretch. Jim Sauter and Dick Trickle going at it for the lead in turn number three. If you like racers, and I mean racer racers, you got to like Dick Trickle. The guy in that red and yellow number 99. Of course, the White Knight is his title, and Rusty Wallace has suddenly darted into the pits. Rusty Wallace may be the most favored among all the pre-race favorites. He's been having a superior year, and there he is. The hood goes up, some smoke coming from underneath, and I'd say that Rusty Wallace, the man who won this race two of the last three years, is in trouble. So, some of the very favorite drivers in this event are encountering problems. Rusty Wallace was second in the ASA point standings going into today's event. With 917, Dick Trickle is the leader of the point standings at this point with 951. And he runs second to this guy, Jim Sonner, right now. Into turn number one, 48 laps have been completed. And Rusty Wallace has just gone a lap down. Sauter, there he is in the upper right-hand corner of your screen, has led this race since the drop of the green flag. 
he and his trailing mate right there, Dick Trickle, have put one lap. This time around, they'll put two laps on Rusty Wallace. So the man who has had, I guess, the best season of any short track late model racer is out of it for victory here today. The hood is up, and the crew is under the number 66 Southland fire equipment car driven by Rusty Wallace, trying to figure out what's wrong with it whether or not they can get it fixed to put Rusty back in the race. But right now, it doesn't look good. He's, he is losing laps as the others continue to run under green conditions. Once again, your leaders out of turn number four and exactly 50 laps have now been completed. It is Jim Sauter, Dick Trickle, running in third place now is Butch Miller, car number 52. Fourth place is Alan Kowicki. In fifth is Bob Seneker. Sixth is Gary Ballou. Seventh place, the number 19 of Joe Rutman. Going eighth is number two, Mark Martin. Ninth is the 11 car driven by Darrell Waltrip. And in tenth place is car number 81, Harold Fair. And we have a report on the Rusty Wallace situation from ASA Timing and Scoring. An oil filter has broken. They're simply trying to tighten it back up or replace it, but it was an oil filter problem on Rusty Wallace. That is a certainly solvable problem, and watch for Wallace to be back out, but now he's four, maybe five laps down, and it'll be nothing but pride for Rusty Wallace when he gets back out. Darrell Waltrip, car number 11, started this race in second position, ran up front for a while, now is has fallen back just a little bit. Running right behind him is Mike Miller in car number 18, who started this race in 17th position. Darrell Waltrip there in the middle of the screen, getting ready to put a lap on Rick Corelli. Rick Corelli, the high plains drifter from Denver, Colorado, goes a lap down as Rusty Wallace pulls out of the pits and rumbles back onto the racing surface. Several laps down as we continue to watch Waltrip. By the way, moving up on Al Shield, one of the local drivers, actually running as Bobby Allison's teammate there in that two-tone blue number 14. Al Shill is a guy who runs in the middle of the field, it seems to speak, at almost all the ASA races. But here in Milwaukee, for the hometown crowd, he really gets psyched up and runs very well. He qualified easily for the field here this weekend. The average speed of the race at this point, slowed by the yellow for the toe-in on Bobby Allison, 105.153 miles an hour. Once again, let's go down to Gary Lee in the pit area, who has another early retiree, NASCAR star David Pearson. David, as a driver, it must be a helpless feeling to just stand and watch the mechanics go to work on the car. Well, it is. You know, uh, when the race very first started, the car was started skipping, so uh, I didn't know where it was just a plug, maybe foul out of what it was. I'm going to try to run along to try to clear it up. So. Uh, but last night they changed the valve springs and stuff on the car, so I don't know where something had slipped or what it was, but uh, it was skipping right off the bat. It's a case where it's a new car for you. You really don't know what to anticipate from the car. No, I, I really don't. Of course, uh, the boys don't know either. It's nothing that I don't think that, you know, that they've done wrong. It's just something that maybe just happened to the car. But the car was highly beautiful, and I felt like it, uh, we really had a real good chance today. So this is really a chance to cool off just a bit. You're standing by, helmet in hand, ready to go back and go racing. Well, I don't know of anybody that would need any help today. Of course, it's a little bit warm, but uh, 200 miles, I don't think it, anybody that can't make 200 miles. We hope to see you back out there. Thank you, David Pearson. And with 55, make that 56 laps completed as Jim Sauter passes the start-finish line. Still running in second position is Nick Frickle, car number 99. Butch Miller is third. Alan Kowicki fourth. And running fifth is Bob Seneker. Darrell Waltrip, car number 11, has dropped back to ninth position at this time. And the battle for fourth and fifth position here between Alan Kowicki and Bob Sineker. I tell you, remember that number and color, number 84, color blue, later on in this race. I like the race that Sineker is running. Here's a very experienced veteran race driver who really knows how to win these intermediate length races. You might call it a long race, I suppose, for an ASA field, but Seneker has been as successful as any man in the country, winning 150 and 200 mile races, maybe with the exception of Dick Trickle, over the last decade. He didn't qualify quite as fast as some of the really front runners, 
He showed some real strength early in the race, and I had the feeling at that time that Seneca was doing a little bit of self-experimentation. I like the race that Seneca is running. He could be very tough, particularly in the last 50 laps of this event. Outside the first 10, those of you who follow ASA racing might be interested to hear the names that are still on the lead lap. Bobby Dodder, one of the early season surprises running up front in the point standings in the first three all year long. All these people still on the lead lap as we look at Bob Seneker, about whom we were just talking, the winningest driver of all time, and the guy who has a stranglehold on the Winchester Speedway. Some of the other drivers still on the lead lap, but not in the top 10. Jordy Ridley out of the NASCAR ranks. Harold Fair, who always seems to be in the top 10, runs competitive. And the leader, Jim Sauter, slows going out of turn number two down the back stretch. Jim Sauter's car has faltered on him, and there he is running very slowly down the back stretch. You saw Dick Trickle go around quickly, and problems now with Jim Sauter in car number five. We'll see if he can make it around to his pit. But trouble with Jim Sauter's car number five. That prototype, Hal Firebird. And boy, I'll tell you, Sauter looked like he had him covered. You'll see it on the replay. Sauter coming out of uh, the fourth turn. Uh, this is the last green flag lap. The hand is out already as he comes down the front stretch. There goes Trickle by on the high side, and Sauter is already without power as he looks down into turn number one, signaling to the crew. No, he's signaling to the safety crew members, telling him that he's pulling it right directly to the garage area. So a tremendous turn of events here as Jim Sauter, who led the first 60 laps, now drops out of the race and Dick Trickle assumes the lead. Lap number 61. That puts Butch Miller in second position, Kowicki third, Seneca fourth, and in fifth place, Gary Ballou, car number 12. So some interesting developments here in the early going. Some of the big NASCAR drivers and some of the ASA stars have fallen by the wayside. Well, Pearson is gone. Bobby Allison is gone. Jim Sauter is gone, as is Mike Eddy. But we still are just chock full of a lot of superstars of stock car racing. I want to complete that list as we look at the current leader, Dick Trickle, of some of the regulars who are not in contention for the lead, but hold on to your thoughts about them for later on in the race. Tom Jones, who finished second earlier this year at the Silverdome, is still in it. Kent Stoffer, the number 51 of Dennis Vogel, and the car numbered 40, which Terry Seneca, Bob Seneca's younger brother, is piloting this weekend. Also still on the lead lap, out there and in the hunt, you might say. There is Dick Trickle going to the high side of Bob Strait in car number 80. Strait was the driver who had problems at the very start of the race and has not been suspended. Back with more of the Milwaukee 200 in a moment. 63 laps have been completed. Back in Milwaukee, and the race continues to run under green condition. On the far right-hand side of your screen, you just caught a glimpse, a glimpse, that is, of Bob Seneca. He has just moved into third. Seneca got underneath Alan Kowicki going into turn number one, and Bob Seneca, there he is, right on the high side of Bob Strait. He'll be battling Butch Miller for second. Bob Seneca continues to rise toward the top. Bob Seneca going to the high groove outside of turn number four. Right in front of him, the second place car of Butch Miller. They flash down the main straightaway. We'll see how this battle develops here in the first and second turns as the first four cars are now running very close to each other on the racetrack. With the demise of Jim Sutter, things have tightened up quite a bit. Speaking of Jim Sutter, here he is with Gary Lee. Well, actually, we cannot talk to Jim because we cannot talk about his demise yet. He is going to rejoin the fray. It was a broken ignition wire, actually a coil wire that was broken. They tightened that up, fired the car up, and he's right now leaving the garage compound area and now running through the pit area, so Jim Sauter will rejoin the fray. But he is several laps back, and I think you would pretty much have to count him out of a possible win here this afternoon. The Decida Flyer, Jim Sauter, who has a victory at the Daytona International Speedway. He picked that up back in the late 1970s in an ARCA race. The man who is famous not only for his ability to drive race cars, but also because of his family. He has quite a brood. He's just an outstanding family man. He's a tough, sturdily built race driver and really one of the finest guys you're going to find at any racetrack in the country. Jimmy Sauter, but 
victory will not be his here at Milwaukee today. You are watching the first three cars here go down the back stretch, passing a slower car to the inside. There is Jim Sauter back on the racetrack, and he is coming back into the pit area once again. So the problems have not been corrected on that car. He once again falls behind the wall, and Jim Sauter will go to work again on that car. Now, during qualifying, they had a problem with an oil leak. They felt they had it repaired, and needless to say, when he came back out and qualified, he sat right on the pole. His qualification run this weekend was his first pole of this season. Again, there are your first three cars in this 200-mile race here at Milwaukee. They are passing the slower white car in turn number three. The leader is Dick Trickle. Second position is Mike Miller, or rather Butch Miller in car number 52. And third place is Bob Sinecker. They come off of turn number four, slower car moving to the inside. Bob Sinecker also looking to the inside of Miller as they go into turn number one, but cannot pick up the position. Now down into turn number one, the slower car moving to the inside, and everybody getting around as they go down the back stretch once again. Running in fourth position is Alan Kowicki, but he is several car lengths behind. Looks like Bob Sinecker might try to make a move again on Miller, but cannot, and we have a yellow flag displayed over the speedway, and we'll look around to see what the problem might be. We don't see anything obvious at this point. It could be debris on the racetrack. That's the likely candidate for the reason for this yellow flag. Certainly is a, a nice break, yet it is debris. We now get the report over the radios that we have debris on the racetrack in turn number one. The safety crews, there you see them getting ready to go out and retrieve the air in peace, hopefully not falling off one of the race cars, and certainly hopefully not falling off one of our leaders as the number 56 race car pulls into the pit area. Number 56 car driven by Kurt Cheshire. Kurt has had a share of problems today. One of the fellows who just barely got into this field yesterday as we had a tremendous lineup of cars that attempted to qualify. We might briefly run down the list of drivers who did not qualify. Don Walter out of Franklin, Wisconsin, his number 58 was among the non-qualifiers. Butch Mirendorf and Art Goen, semi-ASA regular. Kenny Lund and one of the few Ford products entered. Bruce Barris of Belgium, Wisconsin. Tony Tantarelli in his old Mustang was one of the people who came and attempted to get into the race this weekend, but lost an engine while he qualified. And last but not least, in the spectacularly painted number 38, Lime Gold and Candy Apple Red. And I'll tell you, it was beautiful. Jeep Bloom out of Cincinnati, Ohio. Those are the guys who tried to get in here, but just found the competition too tough this weekend at the Milwaukee State Fair Park. And all the leaders are coming into the pits. Well, we mentioned that one pit stop is mandatory in this race as everybody heads in for their required stop. Now, they may make another one throughout the afternoon, but this is the required stop that everybody is making, or just about everybody. In fact, I believe every single, well, all but one car, and that is Buddy Schrock, number 35. He is the only car that did not pit and remains on the racetrack. Everybody else is in. There is Bob Sinecker as the crew works on his car. Fuel being put in, tires changed on the right side. Now they move around to the other side of the car on the left and, and uh, replace the rubber there. There is Dick Trickle, car number 99, the leader of the race. He made a quick pit stop, is back out there. Some of the other cars coming out. Don Gregory is out, so is number 66, Rusty Wallace. Joe Rettman remains in the pit area, as does Daryl Waltrip at number 11. The traffic was so heavy in the pits that Dave Tomzak in car number 26 came into pit. His space is between Rick Corelli's and Gary Ballou, and Tomzak did not even have enough room to get in. Corelli is sitting sideways. It's going to be difficult for Rick to pull out without backing out. He just barely has enough room to clear Gary Ballou as Corelli pulls out. But as Bob mentioned, everybody safe for Buddy Schrock, and Schrock was a lap down, so I don't even think that Buddy got credit for leading the lap. Butch Miller was the first of the leaders to actually come across the start-finish line. We're now on lap 72 under yellow at the Milwaukee 200 for ASA Stock Cars, and we now present a track back. These ASA stock cars utilize quick change rear ends similar to the sprint cars that would take the back plate off the rear end, take the old gears out, put the new ones in, put the plate back on, put the gear grease in. The entire operation takes less than five minutes. Stay with us for more action from State Fair Park in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. So the first
first round of pit stops have been made here. 75 laps have been completed, and several of the cars made a couple of pit stops. Here are the top four. Dick Trickle, the leader, Bob Sinecker is second, Alan Kowicki is third, and Mark Martin is running in fourth place. Fifth is Butch Miller. Sixth place is Harold Fair. Seventh is the number 18 of Mike Miller. Eighth is number 19, Joe Rutman. And in ninth position is car number 12, driven by Gary Ballou. So that's the way they're running. 75 laps have been completed. We are still under caution because of debris on the racetrack up in turn number one. However, the pace car has turned off its yellow light, is speeding up ahead of the field, and we expect to get the green as they come down this time. A resumption of the Milwaukee 200 for ASA Stock Cars. a guy who suddenly appeared. There's an orange and white car just to the right of your screen. It's a little bit out of the camera shot right now. Mark Martin has suddenly exploded into the top four. Martin had a great pit stop. There he is on the screen. Mark is on the lead lap. He's been running 10th or 11th all day. The team got him in and out in fantastic fashion. This is the Bob Strait team from a year ago, and Mark Martin is suddenly in the number one, two, three, fourth position. Remember there was a time when Mark Martin the very best at winning an ASA race. Mark Barton is in third position, as a matter of fact, and Alan Kulwicki pulls up alongside him to challenge him for that position. Now, Rusty Wallace, number 66, as Kulwicki does indeed go into third place. Uh, Rusty Wallace, in number 66, is in that group. However, he is a lap down, and yellow once again as a car has spun, and I think may have come in contact with the wall. That's by Arnie Kristen, and also involved in that little melee up there in turn number two was uh, Davy Allison. It happened back in the pack at this restart, the restart following our first yellow flag of the day, and the second one comes out in rapid fire fashion, so we did not pick it up here, but Arnie Kristen and Davy Allison involved. Incidentally, a word about those pit stops. We mentioned Dennis Vogel apparently also involved in the fracas, so there were at least three cars involved. The word about the last pit stops. They stop at approximately lap number 70, and that's an indication that probably the cars cannot go the distance without stopping again. So I think we're in for a couple of, or at least rather one more pit stop. And if we have green flag between now and say lap 180 or lap 190, it could get very interesting because stopping at lap 170, that's just about the maximum, 120 to 130 laps left. That's just about the maximum these cars can go on this track without stopping. So we continue to run under green. Coming in at lap number 70 is going to cause some real head scratching for some of these teams. I think it's a credit to these drivers here today. Uh, this has been the only incident of the race with 78 laps completed, and that was a minor one. The yellow is out. More pit stops are being made, and we'll be right back. on the lead lap at Milwaukee with 80 laps completed and still under caution. The pace car picks up speed in turn number three. We expect a resumption of this race in just a few seconds. The reason for this most recent incident, or yellow, was because of an incident up in turn number two involving a few cars, Arnie Christen, Dennis Vogel, and Davey Allison. No serious damage to any of those cars. As the green flag comes out, Bob Sinecker gets a great jump Bob Seneker becomes our third leader of the day. Our initial leader was Jim Sauter. He dropped out of the race on lap 60. Dick Trickle took over the lead on 61 and has held it until lap number 81 when Bob Seneker got off to a great start when the green came out again and is now in the lead. Here they come off the fourth turn and the yellow is out. We have a car that has spun up in turn number four. However, he has uh, continued to keep his engine running. That is Bob Strait, car number eight. He looks like he may have had some uh, contact with the wall as a little bit of body damage is noticeable on the left side of the car, but Strait is still in competition out there. Bob Strait, who finished sixth in points a year ago in ASA, but boy, I'll tell you, 1983 has just been tougher than Mount Everest for this guy. It just won't seem to fall into place. He had no wins last year, but I think we mentioned earlier he did have a pole position, and six times he finished in the top five. 
currently straight is way down in 18th place. And we say way down because he expected to be easily in the top 10 and built from the top five in the point standings this year. There's Bob Strait, car number 80, moving to the inside of everybody else, indicating that he will probably make a pit stop this time around, although he does stay out there on the racetrack. So Bob Seneker in car number 84 really put the pedal to the metal when the green flag came out and moved around Dick Trickle to go into the lead and there is Bob Seneker who now leads the rest of the field slowly down the back stretch. Bob Seneker, a name that has become legendary really in ASA annals, a guy who ran the, all the outlaw circuit you might say around home around the Berlin, Michigan area. Uh, the Grand Rapids, Michigan area, running in southern Michigan and northern Ohio for quite a number of years before ASA came around. Now we're looking uh, not only at the Seneca, but also Bob Strait, who runs right there in front of him. There is Joe Rutman as Davey Allison ducks to the inside, apparently headed for the pits. Rutman is in the Dennis Springs house car this weekend. This is a race car that is having its milestone weekend, uh, to use the words of its inventor and proprietor of the shop that produces the Springs race cars, Dennis Springs. Joe Rutman at one time was one of the most successful drivers here at this racetrack. It was at the time when he was just going wild in USAC racing, winning one out of every four races he entered. He was a USAC champion a couple times and has won here at this racetrack. One of the most versatile drivers in all of racing. He also run on dirt. And we go down to Gary Lee for an observation in the pit area. We are down here in Joe Rutman's pit area. There is a certain camaraderie in stock car racing. As you look over my shoulder, you can see the crew members wearing blue shirts that read Mueller Brothers in USAC number nine. This is actually the crew of Dean Roper, the two-time USAC stock car champion. Dean was not racing this weekend, and Joe didn't have a crew. So they said, let's get together, have some fun in Milwaukee. So here they are. And Bob Strait, who is the reason for this yellow period here, has pulled into the pit area, and some work has been done on that car. He is now back out there. Davey Allison made another pit stop uh, last time around. Field comes around turn number four, still under reduced speed here. The standings are as follows. The leader is Bob Seneker. Second position is Dick Trickle. Third is Alan Kowicki. Fourth position belongs to Mark Martin. In fifth place is Joe Rutman. Sixth is Butch Miller. Seventh is the number 12 of Gary Ballou. So those are your first seven positions now with 85 laps completed. And we could get a green flag next time around. The safety crews working up in turn number four where Bob Strait spun have now completed their work up there and have gone to their assigned positions. So perhaps this time around we'll get the green flag. There are the leaders going down the back stretch. Kowicki goes by, Wallace goes by, several laps uh, down. Rutman goes by, he's still in the top five. Mark Martin, of course, Bob Seneker, the leader of the entire race. We've still got more than halfway to go, so uh, <laughs> anything could happen from this point. And the green flag comes out once again. Lap number 86, we're back to racing. sure that uh, Dick Trickle did not get the good jump as he did on Trickle last time we went back to racing and Seneker maintains the lead. The battle is for second position right now as Alan Kowicki has reared his head again and is on the inside of Dick Trickle in turn number four. Battle for second position. Here they come side by side. It is Alan Kowicki with a slight advantage across the start finish line. Dick Trickle right beside him though but as they go into turn number one, Alan Kowicki moves clearly into second to third. Joe Rutman has passed Mark Martin for fourth. Martin drops back to fifth. Well, I think we're seeing a lot of examples, Bob, that uh, a whole lot of these folks aren't necessarily giving it every little thing they got. There's Butch Miller. He's still in it, the Lawton, Michigan driver. He's won twice this year. He's running in fifth position right now. And there are a whole lot of guys up there, I think, that uh, may be biding their time just a little bit, playing a little more of a head game than a foot game. Moved to the inside of Mark Martin, and it is 
the number 52 of Butch Miller going into fourth position below fifth and Mark Martin back to sixth position now Mark had moved up steadily but now begins to fall back just a little bit Gary Ballou car number 12 running in fifth place right now right in the head of him is Butch Miller in car number 52 and Joe Rutman in 19. Boy, I'll tell you, the competition is so close. You see him dirt tracking a little bit in the corner number one. Gary Ballou tried to get underneath Joe Rutman. These cars are reaching speeds 140, maybe 145 miles an hour down the straightaways at this relatively flat one-mile oval. And there's so little margin for error. There must be about 15 of them that are running within about a 20th or a fifth of a second, 20 hundredths of a second, about a fifth of a second from one another. And they're literally door handle to door handle. Right ahead of him, the fifth place car of Joe Rutman. Now he moves alongside Rutman down the back stretch. Gary Ballou standing on the accelerator going into the third turn, picks up the position. Ballou moves to fifth, and Joe Rutman in car number 19 falls back to sixth position. Gary Ballou from Fort Lauderdale, Florida. The top chassis that Gary Ballou is in is one of the most interesting cars here today, really. If you get inside of that car, look in the cockpit, everything that is absolutely minutely legal in terms of the aerodynamics inside the car has been done to it. You look in the inside of the number 112 car, or 12 as it's racing under here this weekend for scoring purposes, you almost get the feeling that you're looking inside of a Can-Am car as everything was sealed up on the inside to direct the air from the front of the car through the cockpit and out the tail. You know, Larry, we did an Indianapolis type car race in Cleveland, Ohio earlier this year. And the temperatures were in the mid-90s at that time and the drivers had a lot of problems with being overcome with the heat. The temperature, I would guess, is almost as warm today. And I would imagine the humidity is a little bit higher, but in this type of racing, these kind of cars, it's a lot cooler for the driver. There is second and third, the joust going on between the local driver, Alan Kowicki, and you've got to say, I guess, that Dick Trickle from nearby Wisconsin Rapids is also a local driver. Trickle considers this his home track, and by the way, as we go yellow again for the fourth time today, we have a car that has spun and apparently made contact with the outer retaining wall. Trickle considers this race his Super Bowl. Dick Trickle has won like over a thousand races in his career as we look at Kurt Cheshire, but Drip Trickle says that this race is the most important one he enters every year. Kurt Cheshire's car is up against the wall in turn number three, and that will bring out our fifth yellow of the afternoon. No serious accidents to this point, a couple of spins, and uh, tow in on Bobby Allison and uh, yellow for some debris on the racetrack, but it's been a very safe race to this point. Once again, the drivers reduce their speeds and can catch a quick breath of air as the pace car is out on the racetrack and the field behind it with Bob Seneker right behind the pace car on the back stretch. Alan Kowicki right behind Seneker and Nick Trickle in third position. So some great competition to this point and we have got a little over 100 laps to go. We are on lap number 94 now, so we have 106 laps remaining. Annually, this crowd here at Milwaukee is the biggest ASA-only race crowd. The ASA stock cars here at Milwaukee, they're very aerodynamically tuned, and we present a track back. Aerodynamics, air dams, how do you keep ASA cars from looking like the gang from Star Wars? Well, you standardize the nose pieces. These cost about $45 a piece. You can see the front end is in two halves. Each half weighs about three or four pounds, and you have to buy them from an ASA-approved store. You can't make your own. Where do you find an ASA-approved store? Well, right here at the racetrack. Thousands of uh, very warm race fans on hand here in Milwaukee today. We're almost halfway through, and Bob Seneker is the leader. pounds with a 9 to 1 compression engine. These things are still turning out well above 500, maybe peaking at 600 horsepower. Coil over suspension, offset frames to the left, and rack and pinion steering. That's an ASA car. 12 
both cars are on the lead lap as we approach the halfway point. As they come down this time, the green will come out and will click off lap number 98. Bob Seneker still has the lead with Kowicki running in second place. And then a scramble for position as Gary Ballou heads high on the racetrack and passes Dick Trickle for third position. And Kowicki moves to the inside of Seneker and takes over the lead. Alan Kowicki momentarily becomes our fourth leader of the afternoon. Boy, watch that guy in the second blue car. There are two blue ones on the screen. Kowicki, the current leader, followed by Seneca and Gary Ballou. Gary Ballou may be the most aggressive driver that you could see week in and week out running in almost any type of race car and almost any type of surface has really begun to attempt to enforce himself here as he has moved into second position. His high water mark of this race so far. Gary Ballou making his move down the back stretch. Now runs second, Seneca third, and Dick Trickle in fourth position right there in fifth is Butch Miller in car number 52. So the first five cars running very close together on the racetrack. There is third, fourth, and fifth as they come out of turn number four onto the main straightaway. And cross flags are displayed by Johnny Potts, the official starter for the American Speed Association. The cross flags indicating we are halfway through this event. Bob Sinegar, Dick Trickle, and Butch Miller, third, fourth, and fifth out there right now as they come down the back stretch. Last week at Bristol, as we look at Bob Seneca running in third, as we battle for fourth, the battle for fourth between Trickle on the inside and trying the high side is Butch Miller. There is the battle for first as Kowicki scoots across the start-finish line with Gary Ballou breathing down his back tailpipes. Boy, they're almost side by side now in turn number two. And we have a new leader down the backstretch. Gary Ballou noses ahead of Alan Kowicki. Gary Ballou has taken over the lead. Gary started this race in 11th position and is now on the lead. Out of turn number four, he'll be shown as the leader of lap number 102. He is our fifth leader of the day, Gary Ballou. Ballou is a man who you might suggest uses a little bit of intimidation sometimes behind the steering wheel of a race car. Gary Ballou is a kind of person who, when he's behind you and he's competitive, you know it. Ballou lets you know that he's there. There are no surprise passes from Gary Lou, Gary Ballou. He'll come up and beat on you, to use a racing term. That's not a literal translation, translation of the word. But Ballou is tough. He's rugged. He's a hard racer. And he can really control a race car. He, Gary Ballou can pull a race car out of predicaments that the average driver is not capable of. We have of. a car hitting a wall or spinning down out of turn number four. Another car involved. He also backs into the retaining wall. One of the cars involved is Dennis Lampman, number nine, one of the Rookie of the Year candidates. And the other car, Rick Corelli, car number six from Denver, Colorado. Corelli's car spun initially and was blocking the, uh, the racetrack ahead of Dennis Lampman. He backed his car into the wall. However, Corelli's car has stalled down at almost the entrance to the pit area. Rick Corelli, who came here this weekend with pretty high expectations that we mentioned earlier in the show that He's been pretty tough west of the Mississippi River, and he has been a top 10 contender most of the times that he has run with ASA, but he was really tough sled this weekend for this western mountainous driver, Rick Corelli, and never was really in it this day, but I'll tell you, remember the name Rick Corelli because he's going to be around for a while. He's a big, strong, tough, athletic type guy, and you just got the feeling that here is one of the stars of the future in full body or stock car racing. Well, let's assess the situation, Larry. We have seen six leaders to this point. I mean, beg your pardon, five leaders to this point. Jim Sauter, who is out of the race, but Dick Trickle, Bob Sinecker, Alan Kowicki, and Gary Ballou are still in and still running right up front, and each of them has displayed their ability to take the lead whenever they want to. Yeah, they really have. Of course, the secret here is not only to be able to flex muscle in the center portions of the race, but also to finish. And in that regard, you've got to say that Seneca and Kowicki, Alan Kowicki, finished more laps than any other ASA driver a year ago. they got a leg up, Seneca and Kowicki. We're still under yellow, and Rick Corelli from Denver, Colorado, has brought his car into the pit. We'll see if he can get going again. We'll answer that question in just a moment. <laughs> One hundred six laps completed here at Milwaukee. 
And the pace car has pulled ahead of the field and is about to go into the pit area and the green about to come back out. Gary Ballou is the leader. Bob Sinecker running in second position. Alan Kulwicki is third. Fourth is Dick Trickle and fifth is Butch Miller running in sixth position is Mike Miller in car number 18. In seventh is car 11, Daryl Waltrip. Eighth is Mark Martin. Ninth place, Bobby Dodder and Joe Rutman. And 11th, car number 24, Jody Ridley. Those cars are on the lead lap, a lap down in car number 40, Terry Seneker. 17, Arnie Christen. Number seven, Don Gregory. Gary Lee in the pit area with this note. Gary? Gary Ballou is driving a Bach chassis. The chassis apparently is making the difference for Ballou now. Prior to his pit stop, he said the car was not handling. He asked for more stagger than before. Stagger on the car. He says now the car is handling the perfection. And that is the reason why he is out in front leading. Also, the crew says they could go to distance without stopping. However, if there is a yellow within 25 laps of the end, look for Gary Ballou to stop to top off the fuel. Gary Ballou is the leader and running a few car lengths ahead of Bob Sinecker. 109 laps completed as they come down this time. It'll be lap number 110 and we have 90 to go. Bob, I'd be surprised as the leaders go by to complete lap number 110. I would be surprised if any of the front running cars can go the distance. Repeating again, that stop came at 70 miles and normally is the situation in ASA racing about the maximum you can go. The maximum is 130 miles on a load of fuel, 22 gallon fuel cells in these race cars. So I really think that to be competitive all race long, everybody's gonna have to stop. Running in fifth position is car number 18, driven by Mike Miller from Canton, Georgia. Mike started in 17th position and has moved up to fifth, passing Dick Trickle a lap ago, and Trickle now back in sixth. Mr. 9 to 1, Mike Miller. As a matter of fact, Mike Miller and Dick Trickle, the two guys on the screen right now, are the two drivers who really developed this 9 to 1 compression engine that is being used by all the frontline ASA cars now in 1983. It's an engine that has much longer life. The old 13 to 1 or high performance racing engines really would go about a maximum of 1,000 miles before you had to tear it down and repair it or you lost it. These new engines at just 9 to 1 compression ratio, actually 9.49 to 1, you can get up to 2,500 miles out of them. It's a big money saver and I think one of the really important stories of short track late model racing for 1983. And we have another change of position up front. Butch Miller, car number 52, moves into third place. Kowicki back to fourth. There is the third and fourth place cars. Butch Miller, car 52 from Lawton, Michigan, a 30-year-old driver. And behind him in fourth place is Alan Kulwicki. Butch Miller, car 52. Daryl Waltrip is having something beginning to develop on his car. Part of the bodywork just behind the right front wheel has broken loose from the chassis. Now that should not be a serious problem unless it happens to fly off and catch the right side door. But Waltrip will be keeping an eye on that as the panel for the number one position begins to heat up. There is Senator, the Bluebird in car number 84 and exciting Gary Ballou, the leader in car number 112. And look at Seneca swishing a little bit as he comes out of turn number four. Seneca wants the lead back. Bob Seneca looking for every opportunity to get by but can't find it and backs off the accelerator just a little and lets Gary Ballou inch ahead. Ballou and Seneca battling for the lead here in Milwaukee at lap number 115. 
can see that uh, they tried to tape over the one which preceded the 12. Actually, this car came here as number 112, but for scoring purposes, they covered up one of the ones to make it just plain 12, but the tape is beginning to flow off of that uh, particular race car, and you can clearly see the second one there on the left side of the car, but it isn't uh, affecting the handling or the driving of this car as Gary Malou continues to set the pace. You just can't look at Gary Ballou and see the number 112 and not think of some of his exploits at the one-mile dirt track in Syracuse, New York. Remember three years ago when Gary Ballou showed up with the Lincoln Continental Modified and absolutely decimated the field as Seneca is really working Ballou over. I think he's got him this time. Well, they have a slow car in front of him, Kurt Cheshire, and that is the reason that Bob Seneca goes into the lead once again. So as they tried to pass that slower car in turn number one, Bob Seneca had the line. He now moves back into the lead, and Gary Ballou falls back into second. But still, those cars continue to run very close to each other on the racetrack. Butch Miller, meanwhile, continues to run in third place. He's sneaking up. There he is, the red car, the third car in the picture. And Alan Kowicki is fourth, but he is a few car lengths behind Butch Miller. There are the first three cars. It's that close at this point at the Milwaukee 200. Bob Seneca has won twice in 1983 as they go to the high side of a Cincinnati driver, Mike Patrick. By the way, no relation to the dirt track star, Pat Patrick. They sweep around Patrick through the third and fourth corners on this racetrack. Heavy, slower traffic in front of them as also right directly in the car number 92 for this weekend is Willie Gate, one of the infrequent competitors with the ASA ranks. Seneca has won twice this year having won at the Queen City Speedway near Cincinnati, Ohio, and at home at the Berlin Speedway in Marne, Michigan. Seneca won that race the night before he participated in the NASCAR Grand National Race at Michigan International Speedway. Well, the race fans who have gathered here and are sitting out in this hot sunshine are getting their money's worth as we have seen great racing all day. And at this point, the first three cars are running right together on the racetrack. They're being led by Bob Seneca, next Gary Ballou, and then Butch Miller, car 52. And there is Mike Miller in car number 18. He used to live in Wisconsin, Rapids, Wisconsin. He has recently moved to Georgia to run out of the race shops down there. He's with Dick Trickle, two drivers who grew up and spent most of their racing career in the same city, Wisconsin Rapids, Wisconsin, are going at it now as they trade paint for fifth position. Right now, Mike Miller has fifth as they went around that slow car. He took to the high side and Dick Trickle took to the low side to go around Mike Patrick. Now they're on the back stretch, fifth and sixth position. Here is Willie Caton, car number 92 from Kowaskum, Wisconsin. And a battle also developing now for second and third place as the leader, Bob Seneca, goes into turn number one. But Gary Ballou and Butch Miller are beginning now to battle each other for second position. Butch Miller, who has won at the Silverdome and at Bristol, Tennessee, on the very high bank racetrack there, has been competitive every race this year in ASA competition. There's Butch in the white and red trim, number 52, going to work on fellow homestater Bob Seneca. Butch Miller is a guy who really kind of prefers shorter tracks. He's very much at home on a half mile as well as a mile track. He finished third earlier this year some pine speedway when one of his eye contact lenses came out. So a very skilled racing driver who seems to be around at the finish an awful lot of the time would very much like to be the ASA season champion. Butch Miller is fifth in the point standings going into this race. He finished up in fourth place in the final point standings with ASA last year. Some of the slower cars being given the courtesy flag by Johnny Potts, the official starter, and the faster cars go around them. We'll resume with more action from the Milwaukee 200 at State Fair Park in a moment. Right now, 124 laps completed. We welcome you back to the Milwaukee 200 where Bob Seneca is the leader. He goes to the high side of Rick Corelli, who just a few minutes ago. Here is Darrell Waltrip, who is right now in unofficial.
officially seventh position. Waltrip in seventh right now. Has really never been out of the top ten, but has never led this race. Darrell Waltrip, the two-time and defending Grand National Stock Car Champion in that division, won the very first ever in late 19. 72 ASA race, but he has not won an ASA race since 1975, almost 10 years ago already. He came here in this Springs chassis this weekend, very serious about going racing, qualified tremendously well. He performed well early in this race, but he has been off the pace for about the last 60 or 70 laps. Let's go down to Gary Lee with an observation on this Darren Walter run today. Bob, we had intimated earlier there might be a chassis problem. And talking with the crew chief now, indeed, there is a problem. It is with the tires. The heat of this racetrack is causing the tires to expand. That is changing the stagger on the race car. It is changing the handling of the race car. So right now, Darrell cannot keep the stagger he wants under the car because of the heat. A little body damage there also on the right side. These cars are actually made up of three different... Uh, elements. The front of the car is fiberglass, the roof of the car is steel, and the sides are aluminum. And the side, or the right side of that car has apparently worked itself loose and is flapping in the breeze as Darrell Waltrip comes down the main straightaway. You also get an idea how flat this racetrack is. The cars list to the right. Now stagger or larger tires on the outside will compensate for some of that listing to the right. But because this track is so flat and so much of the weight is transferred to the right-hand side when the cars go around the corners, you can actually see these race cars lean to the right as they come out of the turns. The leader continues to be Bob Seneca, car number 84. Behind him is Gary Ballou. And right behind Gary Ballou is the number 52 of Butch Miller. Here you can see the interval between Bob Seneca down the back stretch. It is almost a half a straightaway lead now for Bob Seneca, who is beginning to pull away from the rest of the field. We have 70 laps to go as 130 have been completed. We'll try to get an interval here between the first and second place car. Bob Seneca crosses the start finish line. There is Gary Ballou, and the interval is 1.72 seconds. One of the surprises of the 1983 season in ASA racing has been a young driver out of the Chicago area whose father did a lot of racing at the old Soldier's Field. There he is, Bobby Donner. You don't really want to call him the Tin Soldier, going back to the Soldier's Field route. Maybe the Fiberglass Soldier is a good name for Bobby Donner. He's been like a soldier in ASA racing this year. Every race, he's right in there, slugging away to the very end. He is second in terms of laps completed. He has completed 91% of the laps he has entered in this year in ASA competition. And he's number one in top 10 finishes. Of the 10 races held so far, young Bobby Dodder has finished in the top 10 nine times. He's been in the top three in the point standings most of the season, and that's exactly where he is right now, number three behind Wallace and Trickle. All right, let's recap what we have done so far in this race with 132 laps completed. The leader, Bob Seneca, in car number 84. We have had five leaders besides Seneca. Paul Sutter, Jim Sauter led the early stages, then dropped out. Cars that have also led, Dick Trickle, Alan Kulwicki, and Gary Ballou. We have had six yellow or caution periods. Nothing for anything serious. A couple of spins and a couple of minor contacts with the wall, but nothing very serious. We have 11 cars on the lead lap, and they are as follows. Seneca, the leader. Gary Ballou, second. Butch Miller, third. Alan Kulwicki, fourth. In fifth position is Mike Miller. Sixth is Dick Trickle. Seventh is Darrell Waltrip. Eighth is Mark Martin. Ninth position is Bobby Dodder. Tenth place, number 19, Joe Rutman. And 11th is the number 24, driven by Jody Ridley. And if you're a Bob Seneca fan, don't panic. Yeah, I saw the black flag momentarily the last time by also. I believe it might have been for Jody 
Ridley, who is right behind Bob Seneker. Now, that's just a guess. It did appear to be a black boy. We have a car off the track on the lower side of turn number four. I believe it's Corelli. It is Rick Corelli, who spun earlier in the race, but got back out there. Now a big puff of smoke coming from the rear of that car, and the yellow flag is being displayed. So our seventh caution period of the day brought out by an obvious problem with Rick Corelli's car. Bob Seneca is going to set the tenor for this yellow flag. Don't be surprised if the leaders pit. Now, right now, Seneca's, Seneca, as well as Malou, got to be thinking, it's now a good time to pit. We can duck in now. We get the fuel that eliminates any question. Or will it be another yellow flag? The rest of the field, for the most part, will more or less follow suit with what the leaders do because everybody feels like they're in the same keel right now, the same footing. It's touch and go whether or not they can go the distance, but if the leaders are going to stay out there, so by golly are they. So let's see what happens. They call him the High Plains Drifter. He is Rick Corelli from Denver, Colorado, and he is taking off his crash helmet and unbuckling as that, as that car's engine apparently has let go. Corelli will be climbing out of the car momentarily and the field is bunched up very closely behind the pace car over in turn number three. There is Corelli climbing out of the car right now. And we're going to find out whether or not the leaders choose to pit in just a couple of seconds. And it sure looks like it. It Seneca does indeed. Is right down on the paint. Most of them have dropped to the extreme inside of the racetrack. And they have the safety trucks there ahead of them. We'll see what happens here. Bob Seneker is coming into the pit. So is Gary Ballou, so is Butch Miller, and so is most of the rest of the field. There is one car staying out there, and that is Daryl Waltrip. Waltrip elects not to make a pit stop at this point, so he's going to go into the lead momentarily. The others are headed for pit road. Well, this will do it, unless there's another yellow flag. Don't expect the leaders to come in again. This takes all the bets off about the fuel. Everybody will have enough. Most of the competitors are changing right side or outside rubber. Malou is changing. Colwicky is changing. Seneca's car was up on jacks. They have changed. Butch Miller has changed right side. Mike Miller, Jordy Ridley, who had just gone a lap down to the front running drivers, is also changing right side rubber. Mark Martin's car is left up on jacks. The left side being changed first. So apparently Mark Martin looking to change. No, he changes only left side. So that's a bit of an unusual piece of strategy. Mark Martin, who's not really challenged for the lead, although he's been with the front runners all day, changes inside rubber. Bob Seneca is out of the pits. The uh, Another car besides Darrell Waltrip that was on the lead lap that did not come in, Joe Rutman. So those two will be shown in first and second position. But they have not made their pit stop. And we wonder if they're going to. There, the field is in turn number four. And we'll see, there is Joe Rutman, the other car that did not, on the lead lap, that did not make a pit stop. And both of those drivers continuing to stay on the racetrack. So no pit stop. They're hoping there will be perhaps another yellow later on. They can come in and get service. Bob, Daryl Waltrip, and Joe Rutman did not use this opportunity to pit. Now, do they know something that the rest of the field does not does not know? Do they feel as though they can go the distance? Has Waltrip been holding back? Will he roar out of the starting blocks and knock everybody into the ground at this point? Let's find out as we have 60 laps to go now and the two drivers that we spoke of, the two that did not make pit stops, Darrell Waltrip and Joe Rutman are running nose to tail on the back stretch. The other leaders who did come in are catching up quickly, however, and will continue to watch their progression through some slower traffic. Darrell Waltrip has gone into the lead and Waltrip has not led today, so he becomes our sixth leader of the afternoon. Darrell Waltrip followed by Joe Rutman down the main straightaway and now up in the back of the pack after this series of pit stops, and my goodness, are they scrambling and having a hard time of getting through. Baloo was particularly hung up behind slower traffic in the early stages of this green flag. Let's go to the pit area once again for this report from Gary Lee. Bob, for Darrell Waltrip and crew, it's a roll of the dice, kind of the strategy being played right now. They do need to make one pit stop. They are hoping for another yellow, but at this point, they were not ready to come in. They want to run some more on these tires before they change tires to go for the finish. Now, 
now we have also checked in with the crew of Bob Seneker. Bob is very happy with the Bluebird. They changed all four tires. However, they did not change the stagger, so Bob is ready with new rubber to go the distance. All right, and here are the drivers that did make a pit stop moving up through traffic. Included in this group of drivers, Dick Prickle, Mark Martin, Mike Miller, and others as they try to catch up with Joe Rutman and Darrell Waltrip. Gary Ballou, as we mentioned a couple of minutes ago, is also in that group, and I'll tell you, they have lost about a quarter of a lap, I think that may be a fifth of a lap, a straightaway distance, as we look at fourth and fifth running Trickle and Mike Miller, they have lost about a whole straightaway to Waltrip and Rutman, who are out front nose to tail, they're now coming down the front stretch, they cross the start finish line, and Trickle just now comes out of turn number four, Alan Kowicki is also in that group. Mike Miller. Dick Trickle led laps 61 through 80 and also led some laps after that. But right now, because of the pit stop that he made a few minutes ago, is trying to catch up with the rest of the field. He is in fourth place right now. In third is Bob Seneker running first and second. Darrell Waltrip and Joe Rutman. 145 laps have been completed, so we've got 55 more to go. And we're setting up for a tremendous finish of this event. Fifth running, White Knight, Dick Trickle. Sixth running, Mr. 9 to 1. Mike Miller, originally out of Wisconsin, now living down in Georgia. Remember, they're running fifth and sixth and trying to see if they can close in at all on the high flying Gerald Walton and Joe Rutman. Now, interestingly enough, a bit about Rutman and Walchip. The first lap of this green flag segment, Rutman moved right up behind Waltrip and kind of tapped him once, and then he pulled back. Hard to say if Waltrip was just holding back a little bit, or maybe now Rutman is playing the game. But I'll tell you, the guy who's closing in, watch for him. It's a blue car. You just caught a quick glimpse of him on the screen. Number 84 again. Here comes Seneca again. But Miller also moving up quickly, as is Alan Kowicki. So most of the drivers who made a pit stop last caution period have gotten around the slower vehicles and now are moving in on the leaders, Waltrip and Rutman. Third place, Bob Seneca. There's about an equal distance between the first, second, and third positions. About six or eight car lengths separate each of those. As they are now in turn number four, there is Daryl Waltrip, followed by Joe Rutman. Now Bob Sinecker begins to move up on Joe Rutman as they cross the start-finish line. Sinecker setting up Joe Rutman for a pass as we watch Daryl Waltrip continuing to maintain the lead. Close racing here. Bob Sinecker moving to the inside of Joe Rutman down the back stretch, and he is passing with relative ease. Bob Sinecker scoots into second position once again, now sets his sights on Darrell Waltrip, the leader. More on the Joe Rutman story from Gary Lee. It might sound trite, but at this point, it would seem like Bob Seneca is in the catbird seat as he just went around Joe Rutman. The crew indicates that Joe has enough fuel to go the distance. Right now, the car is handling. The tires are good. However, we don't know how long those tires will last, so Joe may make a pit stop, not for fuel, but for new rubber. Bob Seneca has gone into the lead once again. At the end of the back stretch, he goes to the inside and passes Darrell Waltrip. Seneca resumes the lead once again. So a nice display of power by Bob Seneca as he made a pit stop last caution period, but now has worked his way up through the field and has assumed the lead once again. And the important thing is that Seneca flattened both Rutman and Waltrip with one punch. There was no dilly-dallying around once he caught up. Seneca was there. He didn't knock on the door. He just burst right through him with one knockout punch. Moved right past Rutman and then with one more right past Waltrip. Boy, he looks tough right now. Seneca in sixth position in the ASA point standings at this time. He won the race at Queen City Speedway in Westchester, Ohio earlier this year. 
He also picked up a victory at the Berlin Speedway in Marne, Michigan. So two victories to his credit this year so far. And we're getting a report that Dick Trickle may be in trouble. One of the truly strong candidates for victory has a problem in what appears to be the right rear. Dick Trickle has slowed dramatically. And there is Dick Trickle going very slowly on the racetrack. It looks like he is coming in for a pit stop. So Dick Trickle, who was among our leaders, is headed for pit road. We'll see what the crew does to this car, but you can see that there is a problem in the rear end. It looks like uh, a shock or something has broke. One of the crew members gives the sign that it may be all over for Dick Trickle. Perhaps a suspension problem there in the rear end is going a possible victory here today. Well, for Dick Trickle, it has been, I guess what you might call a traumatic week. He told us yesterday that he has attempted to get his previous car owner, Junior Henley, on the phone all of this week in an effort to try and work out the differences that actually resulted from a non-track altercation between the two of them in Cayuga, Canada a couple of weeks ago, but Dick said he had been unable to reach Junior, so he had to go back to this Rusty Wallace team car, and it lasted about 151 laps. And the word we get from the pit area, it is a broken shock that has eliminated Dick Trickle. But the racing resumes on the track, and it is Bob Seneker in the lead, Darrell Waltrip in second position, back in third, still continues to be Joe Rutman in fourth place now is Mike Miller in car number 18, and in fifth place, the cars you're watching now, Butch Miller in car 52, so Mike in 18 and Butch in 52, the Miller boys going at it out there on the racetrack. And you couldn't have a more appropriate name, I guess, to be racing in Milwaukee, Miller and Miller, as they follow Joe Rutman, who doesn't really seem to be able to keep up with the front-running pace. And a big blast of the exhaust coming out of Joe Rutman's car that time as he backed off going into turn number one. Now Mike Miller moves to the inside of Joe Rutman coming off of turn number two. Mike Miller looking to go into third position. They're side by side into turn number three. Joe Rutman on the outside, Mike Miller on the inside. Mike Miller moves around and Butch Miller follows. Off of the fourth turn, both of them are able to pass Joe Rutman and so does Alan Kowicki, or at least Kowicki is trying to as they go into turn number one and again he does. Well, I tell you, you got to be careful on this racetrack today. One mistake, you slip out of the racing groove and it's like being caught outside the trap at Talladega or Daytona. You go from sixth, or rather from second to sixth or second to fifth, just like that. 157 laps about to be completed. Bob Sinecker with a bit of an edge on Darrell Waltrip. We'll try to get an interval next time around, but it is at least a half a straightaway on this one-mile track. So Bob Seneker appears to be on his way to victory as we have 43 laps remaining. There is the second place, Darrell Waltrip in car number 11. But you can see the challenges that are going to be dealt with here in the next few laps as Butch Miller and Mike Miller and Alan Kowicki all are looking at Darrell Waltrip. In terms of growth over the past decade, perhaps this racing organization has grown more than anybody else. And we have a report, Bob, from the pits. And Gary Lee in the Dick Trickle pit. Well, last year we talked with this guy in victory lane. Dick, it won't happen again today. What happened? I guess it broke the shock off the left turn or something. We're fixing it right now. We're going to try to get out and finish the race off. You look very patient in there right now. Obviously, you're impatient on the inside, but you appear to be very calm. Well, the car was very competitive. I can't hear what you're saying. I was right there, you know, that I could have battled him, and the car was pushing. We're being pushed away right now because they want to go racing again, and there it is. As you heard, the car was competitive, but he broke that left rear shock. They have made the change right now, about to put that left rear on, and the man who won this race last year from Wisconsin Rapids, Wisconsin, about to go back and join the battle. So we've had a scramble for positions as we were talking to Dick Trickle. Mike Miller has moved into second place. Butch Miller is in third, Alan Kowicki is in fourth, make that Kowicki in third, 
and Butch in fourth, and back to fifth, Darrell Waltrip. So Waltrip was passed by three cars in that last lap, and Dick Trickle goes back out on the racetrack. And they were all scrambling among one another. There is Mike Miller in car number 18, Kowicki now runs third. I'll tell you, those guys have really been trading positions. It's been like George Steinbrenner's office the last two or three laps among about five guys, and they've been trading. And there's Waltrip all the way back on the tail of that line. Remember, he was second just about a lap and a half ago. Well, I'll tell you, these drivers have been very competitive all afternoon and are still out there jostling and battling for position. Now, Alan Kowicki looked like he was going to make a move on Mike Miller for second place as they went into the third turn. But Mike Miller continues to hold on to the position. Bob Sinecker completes lap 162. The interval is about 3.1 seconds. That's the distance between Seneca, the leader, and the number 18 of Mike Miller running in second place. And there is second, third, and fourth as they go down the back stretch. And that interval between first and second either grows or stabilizes depending upon the whim of Bob Seneca on a particular lap. He is in control of this event. Make no mistake about it. Now, Alan Kowicki once again right up on the back bumper of Mike Miller. Kowicki to the outside, Miller to the inside, down the straightaway into turn number one. They're side by side. This is the battle for second place. Mike Miller with the slightly faster line in those turns maintains the position. Kowicki, however, in number 97 would like very much to go into second as he will not let Mike Miller get ahead and dogs him once again as they go into turn number three. Good racing for second place here between Miller and Kowicki. What Kowicki will try to do if he can't get Miller on the outside is kind of float her in the number one or number three and try and get underneath Mike Miller midway through the turn. There he's trying to move right there, but Miller is Johnny on the spot and close the game. Meanwhile, while Kowicki is trying to pass Mike Miller, it is Butch Miller at number 52 who is sitting back there in fourth position watching the activity in front of him hoping for an opportunity to pass both of them. Second, third, and fourth. Look how close they are on the racetrack. Alan Kowicki seems to have just a little more horsepower than Mike Miller, but Mike is really sticking. Now Kowicki will try and drag Shrimp down the front stretch and squeeze in, but just not quite enough room. Between Mike Miller and the cement wall, there wasn't enough. While all this is going on, Bob Sinecker continues to stretch out the advantage. Sinecker at car number 84 leading this event with 165 laps completed. We're at State Fair Park in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Second, third, and fourth place drivers are passing number 51, driven by Dennis Vogel, the blue car to the inside of the racetrack. Kowicki appears to be faster than Mike Miller. He would really like to shake Miller so that he can go after Seneca. He can see Seneca riding off into the sunset. And with just 35 laps to go, it's doubtful that even if Kowicki is faster than Seneca, and we have a development on pit road. Darrell Waltrip is pitting. Darrell Waltrip is into the pits. Now, is this a routine stop or isn't it? No, it is not. The hood is going up on the car. You'll remember Darrell Waltrip failed to make a pit stop last time we had a yellow when we wondered whether or not he would have enough fuel to go the distance. Well, he definitely will now, but there is other problems that are plaguing Darrell Waltrip. Back to this battle for second, third, and fourth position. By the way, there are nine cars on the lead lap at this point. Nine on the lead lap with Bob Seneca leading and Miller, Kowicki and Miller second, third, and fourth here in turn number four. This type of action is just typical of ASA racing. We've commented a few minutes ago that it's been one of the fastest growing organizations over the last decade. The circuit will travel back to Cayuga International Speedway later in the month of July as we watch Darrell Waltrip go back out into the race. On the 6th of August, they'll be in Anderson, Indiana at the Anderson Speedway for one of the annual races. Lonesome Pine International Raceway in the Southland. They'll be in Michigan and Berlin. Raceway on the 20th of August. Minnesota State Fair Speedway in September 3 through 5 for the Fair Day Race. And they'll be at the High Bank 2 Mile Speedway in Brooklyn, Michigan at the Michigan International Speedway on the 16th to the 18th of September. At the big race of every year, one of the big races of every year on the ASA calendar, the Wind Winchester 400 at the historic Winchester, Indiana, the first weekend in October. And Bob 
Sinecker in number 84 continues to stretch his lead. The advantage over Mike Miller in second position is almost four seconds right now. State Fair Park in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, where we have 30 laps to go. In this Milwaukee 200, Bob Sinecker is the leader. While you were away, Darrell Waltrip in car number 11, who started this race in second position, dropped out of competition. The car went behind the wall. So Darrell Waltrip is out of this race. And again, about a four-second advantage between first and second place. And the battle for second place is now beginning to heat up as we continue to watch Bob Sinecker go down the back stretch. There is the battle for second, and Alan Kowicki did pick up the position back in turn number one. Kowicki is now second, Mike Miller third, and Butch Miller is fourth. Well, Kowicki right away takes off and tries to leave Mike Miller in his dust as we now get a report that Darrell Waltrip broke a valve spring in his car, so Waltrip officially, or has he officially retired, operating perhaps on six or seven cylinders, Waltrip, we believe, has gone back out into the race, but he will not be a threat for victory anymore here today. Larry, I would say that Bob Sinecker is in a position to easily win this race unless uh, he has car problems and, or unless uh, something else goes wrong, he is on his way to victory. Darrell Waltrip has taken off the crash helmet, although he is still in the race car. Now he's beginning to crawl out of the car. Darrell Waltrip retires from competition with just about 25 laps to go in this event. Gary Lee is also right there with Daryl. We heard you had some problem with the chassis set up because of the stagger and the hot tires, but then we started to see some racing savvy out there. When you didn't make that pit stop, we said, uh-oh, Daryl's playing a mind game with the rest of us, but that wasn't the problem. Well, it was running really good, and I had a pretty good set of tires on. And I could, uh, I was in the front, I figured I'd stay out, but something went a sour in the engine. I don't know, I think I broke a valve spring or something like that, and, uh, she just started missing real bad. I'll tell you what, it's been a few years since you've been victorious in ASA competition, and I bet the competition is tougher now than what it was about 1975-76, right? Nope. Nope. Just tough. <laughs> just hard racing. Hard racing. Darrell Waltrip, car 11 out, now a spectator. And, of course, we'll see more of Darrell throughout the year on the NASCAR circuit as we have a spin in turn number two, and the yellow comes out. Well, I cannot see who it is. Uh, Jody Ridley was among the there blue cars. Buddy, Buddy Schrock, number 35, he is, uh, has come to rest toward the inside guardrail in turn number two. So Buddy Schrock, car number 35, brings out our eighth caution of the afternoon. Buddy Schrock in the White Castle sponsored race car. A man who is a former ASA late model sportsman national champion. That division is no longer active. And Buddy is just about the last remnant of that division. He moved up to the late model ranks and continues to run in this Silver Creek Tobacco sponsored series. Silver Creek Tobacco came to the series for the first time in 1983 and has been a success. They're very happy there in and Bobby Batson, their man at the racetrack, told us this weekend that they're actually considering more involvement in terms of assisting sanctioning bodies that they've actually seen an increase in their sales of the product as a result of their involvement in ASA stock car racing. The Silver Creek Tobacco Racing Series enjoying great success not only on the racetrack but also at the cash register. Well, this brings out a very interesting situation. Joe Rutman is coming to the pits. Joe was running in the eighth position. Gary Lee is right there in the Joe Rutman pit. Well, the crew goes to work on the right side. They'll change both front and uh, rear tires. They're topping off the fuel cell. A clean windshield for Joe Rutman. Again, this is the crew that normally handles the chores of Dean Roper, the two-time USAC stock car champion. But Dean is not racing this weekend. And Joe needed a pit crew, so here they are. Now, apparently, they're going to try to change the left front. So we'll change three, now four tires. So all four tires being changed on car 19. They'll top off the fuel, but this will definitely take Joe Rutman out of the competition. Joe Rutman was running in seventh position when this yellow came out, and he will probably not lose a lap. The field is slowed over in turn number three, and the crew is just about completed, so he won't lose a lap, but will drop back. Here are the leaders, Seneca, Kowicki, Miller, and Miller. Thank <laughs> you.
Well, this interesting situation is Joe Rutman, number 19, we saw in the pits a few minutes ago, has joined the crowd again. Now, an interesting situation. Seneca has built up all that lead while the battle for second place was going on. Now, they are running right together. The question is, can Bob Seneca display his awesome power that he has shown us throughout the afternoon, move out into a large lead, or will Kowicki, Mike Miller, Butch Miller, Gary Ballou, and the others challenge him? It looks like it's going to be a fight now as Alan Kowicki moves alongside Bob Seneca down the backstretch into turn number three, a side-by-side -side race, and Alan Kowicki slips by, goes into the lead once again. So Kowicki leads for the second time this afternoon, and is it a, is it a situation where Seneca allowed him to, or did Kowicki just show his power? I would think, Bob, that with the limited number of laps that we have available, that Seneca is giving away nothing, and Joe it has made contact in turn number one. Terry Seneca is spinning. We have a caution flag. Seneca right in the middle of turn number one. Joe Rutman was in the process of trying to race horse through the field. Remember that Dennis Brinks and crew changed rubber on all sides of this race car during the last caution flag. Rutman was in heavy traffic, trying to bulldoze his way to the front. And a couple of the other competitors did not have a real good fix on him in their rear view mirror. And there was contact among two or three cars, and Terry Seneca on the binders ended up spinning out. He did spin, but managed to get the car going again, so he catches up to the tail of the field. And we take a look at the, uh, the tail end of this incident up there in turn number one. The yellow car is Joe Rutman getting through. There's the number 92 of Willie Gatons, and there, and Seneca just barely being missed by, looked like it might have been, no, there's the former pro football player Tom Harrington. I was about to say look like Harrington, but it was another white car painted similar to Harrington's. Perhaps it was Buddy Schrock there who motors right now in front of Terry Seneca. Still nine cars on the lead lap, and as we look out to the racetrack, Alan Kulwicki is right behind the pace car. Bob Seneca, or rather Terry Seneca there in car number 40, has caught up with the rest of the field and falls in uh, at the tail. Alan Kulwicki is first, Bob Seneca second, and Mike Miller is third. We should have a resumption of racing in just a lap or two. Started a little incident there in turn number one a couple of laps ago that resulted in Terry Seneca spinning out in turn number one. The pace car pulls into the field and heads for the pits while the green flag comes back out and the Miller, the Milwaukee 200 is back underway with Kowicki leading. And a scramble for positions behind Kowicki and Bob Seneca. Keep your eyes on Rutman and your thoughts on Rutman. Remember, Dennis Springs and crew completely changed that car over on the last caution, and Rutman looks fast. Now, let's see what happens when Joe Rutman gets up among the front runners. But he has passed about 12 cars in the last seven or eight laps. Now he goes to the high side of Gary Ballou. He has already caught the front runners. He was all the way at the very tail of this line, about 23 or 24 cars strong. Rutman, they made a lot of changes. Think back to the NASCAR race a couple of weeks ago when Cale Yarborough was not competitive all race long. They made changes under the last caution flag and he ran like Jack the Bear and buried everybody else. Could that be the case with Rutman? The word is that Gary Ballou there in car number 12 has very little brakes on that car and is really having to pump them to get slowed down. So that is not necessarily a safe situation out there, but Gary Ballou is continuing to run up front. The leader continues to be Alan Kowicki. Bob Seneca is second. Mike Miller is running in third place. Butch Miller is fourth. And in fifth place is Gary Ballou in car number 12, reportedly without brakes. Right behind Gary Ballou is Joe Rutman. We have a yellow flag, a car up against the wall between turns one and two. Car number 21, David Green, who entered the race here this weekend with car number two. Notice the number on the car. It's a blue block letter number two, very reminiscent of the way Mark Martin's cars had the number two and the same light blue color on them. Well, that's not by coincidence. They've told me this weekend in the pits that he's kind of hoping that maybe this number will bring him the same kind of success that has come to Mark Martin over the past five years, running in late model, even on perhaps to Grand National Stock Car Racing.
David Green, car number 21. He hails from Owensboro, Kentucky. Started this race in 28th position, and he has brought out our 10th caution period of the afternoon. ESPN, your number one auto racing network, will resume coverage of the Milwaukee 200. He is your leader with uh, 186 laps completed. You can see Bob Zinniger pulling right up and almost hitting Alan Kowicki, saying, get going. The green flag is out once again, as indeed it is. 13 laps to go. Alan Kowicki, the leader, is 15th in the point standings with ASA this year with 536. He has won a little more than $17,000 and won the poll for two races. And uh, it's prediction time. Larry, can Kowicki win this thing, or will Bob Sinecker or any of the others back? Well, all race long, I've been saying that I really thought Sinecker was the man, but based only on what I've seen the last five laps, this race is Alan Kowicki's. The wild card, the wild card in the mix is Joe Ruttman, who is right now moving into fifth position, going around Butch Miller. Joe Ruttman runs about 25 car lengths as we look close at Joe Ruttman. Yellow flag again. We have an incident, incident in turn number one, we believe. I'm about to say that Ruttman was 25 car lengths behind the wiki. Now, these recessing or these reoccurring rather yellow flags are really hurting Alan Kowicki's cause. He had the race in his hands. He seemed to be at the controls of this event. He had his rhythm down, and most importantly, he was beating into the ground the man who looked like was the hot shoe for today, Bob Seneker. Well, these yellow flags, as they keep coming out, really work to the disadvantage of Alan Kowicki. Let's go down to Gary Lee in the Gary Ballou pit. Ben Kay is the crew chief, and for a while, your car looked like the car to beat, but now I understand you have some brake woes. Yeah, we did have a little problem there with the brakes just a few minutes ago, but he says now they're all right. I don't know what the problem really was, but it seems to be worked out. So aside from that, the chassis is working, the tires are working. The chassis is working real well. He said that uh, if we'd had a chance, we could have got some stickers that time. It been a little better, but, you know, we wasn't geared up, so we have to go with what we got. So keep an eye on Gary Ballou in the blue number 12. All right, let's run down the uh, top ten for you. There are eight cars on the lead lap. Alan Kowicki, the leader. Bob Sinegar, second. Gary Ballou is third. Fourth is Mike Miller. Fifth is Butch Miller. Sixth place is Joe Rutman. Seventh, Mark Martin. Eighth place is Bobby Donner. Those cars on the lead lap. A lap down in ninth is the number 80, I guess, of uh, Bob Strait. Then car number 24, driven by Jody Ridley. In 11th position is the number 40, driven by Terry Sinecker. And 12th is Tom Jones in number zero. Well, it remains to be seen who will win this race. We've got a little more than seven laps to go. Here are some who will not win. Bobby Allison, Mike Eddy, David Pearson, Dennis Martin, Brad Campbell, Jim Sauter, all of those cars dropped out of the race. Others going by the wayside. Al Schill, Don Rick, Rick Corelli, Harold Fair, Rick Corelli, and Jim Sauter. So those are drivers that are out of the race. The green flag comes out once again, and we have seven laps to go. You predicted just before we had the yellow that Alan Kowicki could hold on to his lead here and win this race. I'll go with Bob Seneker. I think we're going to see him uh, make his move about two or three laps from now. Well, all bets are off, that's for sure. It's Katie by the door for everybody. Everybody is flat out. Nobody's holding back anything. By the way, Rutman, there he is, the second yellow car in line. He has now moved into fourth. Remember, Rutman has fresh rubber all the way around. His car, theoretically, has set up the best of anybody's for the finish here. He's going to work on Gary Below. If he can get by Below, then he goes up to Bob Seneker. And Gary Lee is ready with a report for the pitch. Well, obviously, that last pit stop we thought would take him out of contention, but with the four fresh tires and topped-off fuel, the chassis is working just right for Joe Ruttman, and right now everything is going his way. The question is, does Joe Ruttman have enough laps remaining to catch first and second position? Joe Ruttman is going for it. He's on the inside of Gary Ballou in turn number one. Some real close competition as they went into the first.
first turn. Now Gary Ballou inches ahead just a little bit as they head for turn number three. This is the battle for third place. Joe Rutman to the inside, Gary Ballou to the outside. The first two cars are pulling away, meanwhile, Kowicki and Seneca. Joe Rutman still trying to pick up that third spot as they come down the main straightaway. Has not done it yet. Now he does, going into turn number one. And Rutman gets off of the racetrack. Now Mike Miller in car number 18 tries to pass Gary Ballou. Cannot do it. Joe Rutman with a very, very strange move there going into turn one. Actually got the car off of the racetrack, but picked up third place. Well, Joe Rutman can drive not only pavement, he can drive dirty, he can also drive grass. We just proved that. But let me tell you, he is at least 30 car lengths behind the front-running Alan Kowicki and Bob Seneca. There are about three car lengths that separate Kowicki and Seneca, and Seneca is unable to move in on Kowicki. All right, we've got less than three laps to go. The leaders go down the back stretch. We continue to watch this battle for third place. Right now, Joe Rutman holding on to third position. The leaders, meanwhile, are in turn number four. Down the main straightaway, completing lap number 198. We've got two more laps to go. Two to go for the leaders. The next time, the white flag will come out. There are the first two positions. Alan Kowicki in 97 and Bob Seneca in 84. Down the back stretch now. Some of the slower cars move to the inside of the racetrack drivers make the easy move to the outside of the racetrack. Here they are in turn number four now. Bob Seneca is sneaking up ever so closely down the straightaway. The white flag is out. One more circuit of this one-mile track, and the Milwaukee 200 will be history. Can Alan Kowicki hold on? Bob Seneca is right there on his back bumper, looking for the opportunity to pass. They go down the back stretch, and still Alan Kowicki leading Bob Seneca at the end of the back stretch. Now into turn number three. If Seneca is going to pass, he's going to have to do it right now. He moves up all so closely to the back of Alan Kowicki. He must make his move here. They come off of the fourth turn, down for the checkered flag. Alan Kowicki wins by just about a car length. What a big win for this young driver from right here in the Wisconsin area. He has been searching for sponsorship all year long. There is third and fourth. There's the winner, Alan Kowicki. He had hired a cinematographer to come to this race this weekend to shoot some videotape for him in his help in his search for sponsorship. And not only has he performed well here in front of the hometown fans, but he has won maybe the biggest race of his career. Just a gigantic victory, a significant one, one of the most important short track races in the North every year. And Alan Kowicki, before a hometown, very enthusiastic and supportive crowd, has won the Milwaukee 200. Well, he earned every penny that he'll collect here today as he battled with Bob Seneca toward the end of the race and also battled with some of the other drivers in the middle stages of the race and finally came out on top. So Alan Kowicki taking an assurance lap now will move into victory lane and will celebrate his win here today at Milwaukee. And we'll be back to talk with him in just a moment. Driver from Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Started third, wins the Milwaukee 200. Alan Kowicki and Gary's with him in victory lane. Alan, congratulations. There's no doubt what you're drinking in Alan, Victory Lane. Fine. I'll tell you what, after 200 laps, it came down to a drag race from the fourth turn to the start-finish line. Well, it certainly was close, and for a while in the race, it looked like Bob Seneca had the fastest car. My car was pushing all day, and we kept changing the tires on it. And I'd like to thank the Transact Racing team. They did a great job and got me a good set of tires at the end. The car still pushed a little bit, but it was getting better all day. And it just feels so good to win one here. I've had a lot of, a lot of problems and breakdowns here, and this, this really all makes up for it. I, I just had a feeling yesterday after qualifying that this time might be Miller time for me, and I just couldn't be happier. We well, had a few altercations on the racetrack. Were you at any time close to those? No, I pretty well managed to stay clear of them, and uh, my crew was spotting me, telling me when the yellows were out, and they probably helped save me a couple times. And, all in all, it was a pretty clean race, other than having to hold off Bob Seneca at the end there. 
the weather had to be a factor. Some drivers were complaining that they could not keep stagger under the car because the tires were growing because they were getting so hot. You indicated you had a push earlier. What was the weather like for you? Well, it was hot all day, and our car did push a little bit all day. I don't know, maybe everybody had the same problem, but the car still could have been a little bit looser at the end, but I'm just happy it was good enough to win. We were talking with your crew chief. I said, does he have a big grin on his face? He said, wait for about 10 laps and watch the grin, and look at that smile right there. The victory is Allen. Well, this, this sure makes up for a lot of things. Boy, I'll, I'll tell you, this is the biggest victory of my life, and I'd like to thank the ASA Silver Creek Series and Miller Brewing Company for sponsoring this race. And everybody that came out here today, I'm sure they saw a great race. And come on back and see some more ASA races. And we'll see you over at the Miller tent later. We'll do it. Thank you, Alan. Congratulations, Thank Bob. You. ESPN congratulates the winner of the Milwaukee 200, Alan Kowicki. And we'll be back with some closing comments and a recap of this race after these messages. So the fans begin to file out of State Fair Park in Milwaukee after an exciting race. It was won by Alan Kowicki, and I think the last uh, quarter of a lap or so are very interesting here. A very competitive race. It wasn't easy to win this one. You had to be fast all day long, and on that last quarter lap, Kowicki, after a long, hot day, he had to be tired. He was oh, just about perfect. Take a look at this. This is the last two corners. Seneca roars up behind Kowicki. At this point, Seneca's got all the momentum, and it's like Kowicki is, lead is reading Bob Seneca's mind. Seneca darts low. He looks low. Kowicki is there. Now he says, I'll go high. Kowicki is there. Watch, and they come out of turn number four. Seneca is looking. Where can he go on this racetrack? And Alan Kowicki is right in the way, just like Rick Mee and Marty Johncock. A couple of years ago at Indianapolis, you got to be almost a mind reader to be a successful race driver. Alan Kowicki knew he had the victory just a few feet before he crossed the start-finish line with a salute to the fans. Well, we uh, will leave you with the race summary. We'll show you that there were six leaders, 12 lead changes, 11 yellow flags, 59 laps were included under 90.115 miles an hour. So as we look at the top finishers, we say so long from State Fair Park for Gary Lee and Larry Newber. This is Bob Jenkins saying so long, everyone. Join us again for more ESPN Auto Racing 83.